If the iPhone Absolutely. did not have Instagram, TikTok, mm -hmm. Facebook, Twitter on it, it would probably act differently. Exactly. No, that's right. That's the key. So let's let's be really clear here. Um, and you know what? Let me tell the whole story from the 90s on. Because it because that's the only way you can understand why we let this happen. All right. So uh, the Berlin Wall falls. You know, I'll start right really big. You know, the Berlin Wall falls. It's ecstatic. I mean, nuclear war is a thing of the past. It's going to be amazing. And then the internet comes out a few years later, and it's like, oh my God, even more amazing. And this is going to be the best thing ever to happen to democracy. This is going to topple tyrants everywhere. Um, good luck, China, keeping it out. <laughs> yeah, you'll never do that. Um, so we're we're all techno optimists. I certainly was. Uh, people are writing books about techno optimism, and you know, Robert Wright's book Non Zero. Very exciting time in the '90s. So then, you know, you have the the technology boom that you were you were a part of, and then you you know you begin to get you get Google, you get I mean these are like godlike powers that we're getting. We're all techno optimists, and then social media comes out, and it's free. You can communicate with anyone. No more long distance charges. Um, you know, photos, videos, everything. It's amazing. And early social media, I don't think was particularly harmful. MySpace, Friendster, Facebook, you're because they were they were called social networking systems. You connect with people. That's all you do. Now there's some performance, you make your photos look nice, but there's no news feed, there's no algorithms, you just connect with people. It's all great. Still, we're all techno optimists. The iPhone comes out in 2007. I got my first one in 2008. It is a an amazing digital Swiss army knife. I used to love Swiss army knives, you know, the corkscrew, the magnifying glass, all those tools you could have. And you know, the iPhone, I mean, as Steve Jobs said, what do you say? You know, it's a, it's a telephone, it's a web browser, it's a music, whatever. You know, it's like three things in one. Yeah, and it has maps, it has a flashlight, like it's amazing. Like I love it, everyone loves it. Everything's great so far, right? We're all techno optimists. Okay, now the story begins to change. In 2008, you get the App Store. So now it's not Apple's suite of products. Now it's a million companies trying to get on your phone. And once they got on your phone, they can now directly message you because you get push notifications. I forget 2008, 2009, something like that. You get push notifications. Uh, and then you get the front-facing camera in 2010, and then you get Instagram in 2010, which is the first social media designed only to be used on a smartphone. You couldn't use it on the web. So my point is that if we go back to, let's say, January 1st of 2010, all teens have a phone, but it's almost all, they almost all have a flip phone or a brick phone. They don't have a front-facing camera. They don't have high-speed internet. They have to pay for each text. So in 2010, teens in America and throughout the developed world, they have a recognizably human childhood. They have this tool. They use it a lot. They use it to call each other. They text each other. They meet up. They have fun together. No problem. Mental health is fine. No sign of a problem in 2010, 2011. No sign of a problem. 2012, Facebook buys Instagram. This is the year that Instagram's user base jumps up an order of magnitude. Um, this is the year, especially for girls. The girls begin to migrate their lives onto social onto Instagram on their smartphones with them all the time with their front facing cameras posting selfies commenting on selfies thinking constantly about their looks their boobs their skin how do you know everything is about their looks so the girls I think this explains why for the girls the upward curves are very sharp it's up for girls it's a hockey stick with an elbow right at 2012 for boys it's it's not as sharp it's it's a more gradual rise um, but I think girls lives are transformed in 2012 and we get the end of the play-based childhood. They don't meet up in person very much because you have to, you know, you're spending five hours a day on social media. There's no time to meet up with your friends. So you, the girls are now, they have what I'm calling a phone-based childhood. And so this, I believe, is why by 2015, all the indicators are going up all around, you know, lights are flashing red, emergency, psychiatric emergency departments around the developed world are filling up with girls who've cut themselves, uh, who are poisoning themselves. Um, child, uh, human childhood is over, and what we have is a phone-based childhood that blocks so much about human development, social development, sexual development, cognitive development. Everything is now different in 2015. That's my argument. First of all, what do you think? Did I get the chronology right? Did I miss anything important? No, absolutely. You your, your chronology is spot on, and I sometimes like to tell people who, again, we're talking about people who are starting to be born in 1995, which is horrifying mm -hmm. to me because obviously I was already graduated from college and working. I often find that in audiences. Wait until you're 60 more. like me. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Uh, but 
I think that, no, you have the chronology spot on because most people don't realize that Facebook did not originally have a news feed, that Instagram was not always part of Facebook. I mean, this is now in the distant recesses of time more than a decade ago, and people don't even know. Uh, and I think that you're absolutely right. One of the things that happens, and I'll speak not on behalf of the tech industry, but I'll speak on part of the tech industry, which is people are just trying to build stuff. And yeah. they are yeah. not social scientists and they do not always think through the consequences. And by the way, social scientists and leaders don't always think through all the consequences either because that's hard. And so they say, uh, again, I, I would say that this is the, or this is sort of the original sin. The original sin is that we've taught entrepreneurs and people in the technology industry, listen, the thing you are looking for is user engagement. And we say mm -hmm. user engagement yeah. uh, because that yeah. sounds better than addiction, but you're looking for user <laughs> engagement. Yeah. And if I were to describe perfect user engagement, I would say, well, the more they use it, the better, the more frequently they use it, the better, mm. the more intensively they use it, yeah. the better. Good. because yeah. all those things correlate with the fact that we've got their attention, which we can then monetize through advertising or they're willing to pay mm -hmm. a subscription yeah. fee. And none of that involved anything particularly malicious or uh, any mm -hmm. intentional harm. But you could see it's not amoral. It is not something where you can just sort of say there's no value judgment implied. When mm -hmm. you focus on user engagement to the exclusion of almost every other consideration, what you are saying is I am trying to make my product more and more addictive and I will use every resource I have and all the information I have to yeah. make my product more addictive. That's right. That's right. And here, let's introduce the distinction between children and adults. You know, gamble, you know, if you go walk into a casino, they're doing the same thing. They're doing everything they can to keep you spending money. And, you know, we have a general libertarian culture in the United States. We're not like, you know, the EU where they'll regulate more stuff. We say, you know, look, it's an exploitative environment, but adults can choose it. Some percentage will get addicted. They'll ruin their families, but that's their choice. We don't say that for children. There's a lot of age gating uh, in the world, in the material world. There are reasons why we sometimes have age limits on cigarettes, on gambling, on prostitution. You know, it's legal in a few places. Um, and uh, children are different. And we use age gating, especially for sex, violence, and things that are addictive. And a lot about our digital life is sex. It's exposing children, even as young as 8, 9, 10, to sex, violence, and addiction. Let me just add two crucial features to my chronology based on what you said. I forgot about the, the newsfeed is a very important part of this. Uh, you know, early Facebook didn't have it. Um, I, I forget what year the newsfeed comes in, but the key development from my perspective as a social psychologist is 2009. That's when Twitter adds the retweet button, which is like, it's like super powerful in making everything incredibly viral and explosive. I mean, it, adding the retweet button is like, you know, it's like taking Earth's atmosphere from 20% oxygen and making it 60% oxygen. Like any little fire is going to blow up. So you get the retweet button and then Facebook copies with the share. Uh, Facebook same year introduces the like button, which everybody copies. So by 2010, everywhere you go, there's a share or retweet button. There's a like button. And now the platforms have so much information about what users are doing. It's not just what link they clicked on. It's what do they like? What did they retweet? So now they have so much information that they algorithmize everything. So the newsfeed, I forget what you came in, but it becomes very different. It used to be chronological, um, but it's it's the, it's at this point that these, these platforms are no longer called social networking systems because they're not about connecting. We now call them social media platforms because you stand on a platform and you perform at people. And if everyone is standing on a platform performing and yelling and saying, look at me, and very few people are listening, it's a very, very different world than it was in, say, 2007, 2008. So that's one big change. Uh, things get super duper viral um, around 2000, well, it begins 2009, but it really hits in the early 2010s. And so the, the world that kids are in is much more topsy-turvy craziness, people getting canceled. You get the first global cancellation in 2013. Justine Sacco makes a joke in London and she's fired by the time she lands in South Africa. That wasn't possible in 2008, but it's that's our everyday life now. Global cancellations are now possible. So everything goes kind of crazy in the early 2010s. That's the first thing. The second key thing with the early 2010s, I think is the Arab Spring, because the story there, and there's some truth to it, um, is that young people, especially using Facebook, Twitter, uh, some other, I forget what other pro, you know, texting programs they were, uh, encrypted programs they were using, but you know, it, this was like a democracy fantasy, like 
wow, you know, the, 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 the Iron Curtain fell in Eastern Europe in the 90s, and now finally the Arab world is going to have a reformation. They're going to have a democratic flowering, all thanks to social media. And Mark Zuckerberg is named Person of the Year, I think in 2011. Person of the Year, most important person in the world because the transformation. So again, in 2011, we're still all techno-optimists. And so what's happening? The iPad comes out at what, 2010, I think? 2010, I think that's right, like 2008, that. 2009 or 10, yeah. Okay, so the, the iPad is out um, and kids adore it. I mean, kids are mesmerized by the touch technology, the colors, it fits in their hand, the phone. So it's in the early 2010s that we're all giving our kids, if you have a, you know, my son was born 2006, when he first got a hold of my iPhone in 2008, the fact that he could learn to sweat, he could learn the technology at the age of two, the fact that I did not sell all of my retirement accounts and put them all in Apple stock is one of the great regrets of my life. What was I thinking? Um, it was an amazing technology. The kids loved it. And guess what? When you give it to your kids, you get peace and quiet. You can have a restaurant meal and your kid can sit next to you and everyone's happy. You're busy cooking at home and your kid wants your attention. Give them the tablet. Everyone's happy. So in 2011, everyone's happy and, and social media is going to take down dictators. We're all psyched. Okay. In 2012, the epidemic of mental illness begins. We don't notice it for a few years. And it takes us more years to connect it to technology. And it takes us more years to prove that it's connected to technology. So that's how we got into this sorry state. That's how we basically damaged an entire generation. We're talking, you know, I, I haven't done the calculation, but if we say 20 to 30 countries, everyone born after, 2000, after 1995, I shouldn't say everyone, obviously there are exceptions, but the average generational difference, this is quite possibly the largest destruction of human capital um, in history, other than wars and maybe, you know, black plague, the, the epidemics, things like that. But we, it, this is a huge mistake that we made. Yeah, and, and as we know, again, I think that you're right to offer the caveat, but this is true of everything, right? Not everyone who smokes yeah. goes on to develop lung cancer. Not yeah, I'm a social plays, scientist. I'm talking generalities. Not everyone who plays Russian roulette dies. Just one yeah. second, right? So, <laughs> That's anyway, a good one. I'll uh, use that. But there, so there are a couple of things that in that in that thread that I thought were really interesting. The first is, and I love the fact that you know, we are old enough to remember the events as they happened, uh, at least mm -hmm. for me. One of the things is the key impact of slight reductions in friction. Uh -huh. So the concept of retweeting arose somewhat organically on uh -huh. Twitter as a platform. It didn't have anything like that. Original Twitter is 140 characters. It was delivered on the web or via SMS. And there was no concept of reply or retweet uh -huh. or anything like that. The users spontaneously came up with these things yeah. and typing capital R, capital T, and then pasting in someone else's tweet was the way that you retweeted. Mm -hmm. And that did allow things to go viral, but making it a button instead yeah. of keystroke, keystroke, space, copy, paste, just that mm -hmm. tiny little difference, which is maybe yeah. at most one second, completely no, well, it's couple, no, it's several seconds. It's, it's, several it, you know, yeah, several seconds. But yeah, no, I totally agree. I totally agree. And again, as a social psychologist, we think a lot about friction. There's a famous study uh, done at Yale. The gist of it was uh, uh, young people, they go there, in the experiment, they're told to go to uh, an appointment at the health center. And they're, I think they're given the address, they're told the address. In another condition, it's written down a piece of paper and they're given. That makes a huge difference in who actually goes, whether they have a piece of paper, similar thing. It's absolutely astonishing. And the other is a favorite anecdote I always love telling about children and iPads is one of my friends from college, one of who is married to one of my friends from childhood, they have a couple of kids. They took the kids to Taiwan for vacation mm -hmm. to see some grandparents and relatives and to go explore the island. They have this whole long trip and they come back and they ask the kids, hey, what was your favorite part of the trip? Was it you know going to the amusement park? Was it all the different restaurants? Was it seeing relatives? Was it going out into nature? Mm -hmm. And the answer of course was, when we were on the plane and I could use the iPad for an unlimited <laughs> amount of time, because normally that's I can right. only use it for 30 minutes at a time. Yeah, that's right. Now that's a, that's a, a perfect story for, for, for the story that I'm telling, you know, because you know, I argue, I argue in the book that uh, uh, the phone, the smartphones and the tablets are experience blockers. They're so compelling that as if a kid can get his hands on one, it's going to block out everything else. 
it's going to reduce everything else. The human so, brain is remarkable. We can filter out the surroundings. We can filter out the plane. We can filter out all of that. And yeah. our world becomes what we see in mm -hmm. front of our eyes. That's right. That's right. Now, I, should, I feel some vague obligation to make sure that we're not just purely straw manning. So I want to offer okay. up the standard arguments Please. that people make against so that you can then Let's rebut them and respond mm -hmm. to them. Yeah. The first, uh, the first argument that people make when it comes to this book is to say, well, you know, obviously the number of reported mental, uh, mental health crises and everything has risen, but is that an artifact of reporting? Mm -hmm. Rather, the, we now live in a period of time where you know people are more aware of mental health than ever before, mm -hmm. at least in this country and likely in other developed countries around the world, which are precisely the places that you're looking at. Could this be uh, something where people are seeing more of it? So, for example, mm -hmm. uh, many people have said, oh, my goodness, is there a crisis in the incidence of autism, which is mm -hmm. much higher now than it was before? And yeah. my general response to that is I don't know for certain, but it, I'm pretty sure a lot of it is mm -hmm. reporting. Yeah, um, I think the, uh, there is a general direction to reporting. This is called concept creep, where we start counting smaller and smaller things. So, yes, a portion of it is due to that. But here's two reasons to think it's a small portion. One is that when you look at the curves by self-report, and then you look at the curves that are not self-report, especially hospital admissions, psychiatric ward emergency visits, those are not self-report. Those are hard data from hospitals. They match. They well, they all show an elbow around 2012, at least in the US. I mean, it might be off by a year or two in other places. But so the fact that objective data matches the self-report. Also, if it was just changes in diagnostic criteria, we'd see a gradual increase over the course of a decade or two, but we don't. Things were very steady from the 90, late 90s through 2011. There's, no, there's not an increase, it's not a gradual increase. It's just, it's somebody turned on a switch in 2012 and the girls went crazy. That's not from, now, if you might say, well, once you hook them all up on social media, suddenly they're all sharing ideas, that could explain the sudden 2012, 2013 change but even there, if everyone thinks that they're anxious and depressed, that has feedback effects that can make them more anxious and depressed. So perfectly important objection, but it, it's just, it's a minor factor in what we're seeing. So let's talk about the technology industry and its role, because I think you Wait, mentioned- Wait, is that the only, hold on, I thought you were gonna give me a bunch of counter arguments. I thought you were gonna uh, hit me with a bunch of counter arguments. Most of those counter arguments I don't believe. This is the only one which I have a, a okay. sympathy for. So that's the why, that's the reason I use that one. Okay, got it. The, the other ones, which are basically people trying to determine how many angels can dance on the head of the pin, don't interest me as much. Okay, good. Yeah, the main, char the main charge that some are raising uh, is that I have no evidence, which is absurd because I have been collecting and publishing the evidence since 2019. I'm the only one who gathers all the cherries. You know, I'm accused of cherry picking. I've gone out, I've collected all the studies I can find on both sides, and I put them up. I'm as transparent as can be. If listeners uh, go to anxiousgeneration.com slash reviews, you'll find my Google documents. Everything's organized, hundreds of studies on both sides. You can make up your mind for yourself. I've got a lot of evidence, multiple kinds of evidence pointing to causality. This is not me mistaking correlation for causation as one of my critics has accused me of. And the irony, of course, is these critics who don't bother going to anxiousgeneration.com slash reviews, don't bother looking through the documents, then say, you know, I think that John is drawing unwarranted conclusions from not enough data. Uh, it's a right. conclusion I have yeah. reached by not looking at the data. Yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> and I have a long section in the book itself in chapter six. And so it was a very critical review in nature. And it seemed as though the reviewer hadn't even read chapter six, where I addressed the issue of causality very, very directly. Well, as authors, we know that, you know, we have an entire chapter on responsible blitzscaling and people say, no, you, you talk, you, it's irresponsible. You just tell people go and do it. I'm like, no, actually we have an entire chapter mm. talking about when it's appropriate and what the dangers are. And, but again, this is the nature of the world we live in, which yeah. did not that's start with social media, right? No, the the short true. attention that's span uh, was something that people have complained about from mm -hmm. time immemorial. I'm sure yeah. that there's probably 15th century documents complaining about mm -hmm. how the current generation doesn't take enough time anymore mm -hmm. to read through illuminated manuscripts. Um, <laughs> right. But let's let's talk about the let's talk about the role of the technology industry because sure, we touched on it briefly, and that's something mm -hmm. you really wanted to, to touch about. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we said before, what I essentially said before, is you know you don't have to attribute malice or ill intent no, to see people <clears throat> behaving in a way that ultimately causes significant problems. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's right. So, you know, so I teach in a business school. And before I moved here, I was a social psychologist at the University of Virginia. Uh, you know, I'm a very well-educated American, which means I knew nothing about capitalism, never learned about it. Uh, but I learned a lot about it, and I read a lot when I came to NYU Stern in 2012. I came to have extraordinary respect for the power of free markets to bring betterment to the lives of people all over the world, lift people out of poverty. But that all those benefits depend on having efficient markets without market failures. Um, there was a philosopher who came and spoke here um, from Arizona State University, uh, and he said, uh, David Schmitz was his name, and he said, you know, a good a good free market society is one in which you can only make money by making other people better off. Yes. And that was Adam Smith's original vision too. Um, and so to the extent that in most of our economy, that's the case, everything's great. I love capitalism. I love free markets, the innovation, the dynamism. America is the most dynamic economy. That's all great. But what if... Uh, what if you make money by harming people? Now, of course, you don't want to harm your customers because then they won't buy from you. But what if your product, you sell you sell the product to the advertisers, those are the customers, but the product is not, you know, minerals and rocks, the product is children's attention. So now you're harming children, you're addicting them, you're trying to addict them. Well, now this is not the way to a good society. This is the road to hell. So... Um, and this is why usually uh, the answer to this is usually market regulation. The government's job is to make sure that harmful external effects are not passed on to others. And there's been zero regulation since 2000, um, since 1998, zero, nothing. Uh, so that has to change. So again, I love the tech industry. It is changing the world, but it's changing it in this weird regulatory environment where not only are we not regulating, but Congress actually granted immunity. They say, well, you can't be sued. You can do whatever you want to kids. Oh, you don't have to enforce the age limit. We set it to 13, which is way too low. And you don't have to check it. Just let them let them just lie and they can go anywhere, you know, Pornhub anywhere. So we have this insanely, you know, it's, it's as though we said, you know what? We don't care about children at all. We don't care. Do open season, do what you want with kids. That's what we basically said. And that kind of set the rules for the planet. You know, most other countries then have to abide by that or... So um, so anyway, we made a huge mistake, and it's because it's sort of the dark side of capitalism. Uh, the dark side of free market economy is this incredible competition and innovation creativity can be channeled to harm people if external costs are not factored in uh, and borne by the company. Exactly. The classic case, as you pointed out, of market failure of economic externalities of various kinds, similar to pollution and other things mm -hmm. like that. One of the things that I think is particularly interesting with the technology industry is that especially if we we're just going to focus our attention on social media the primary social media platforms that, are, that we're talking about are highly concentrated mm -hmm. and this country are essentially controlled by two individuals who do not have to answer to anyone else facebook and its founder mark zuckerberg obviously runs facebook but also runs instagram and whatsapp and then Elon Musk owns Twitter as a privately held company. He doesn't even have public shareholders. The public shareholders don't really matter much in Facebook's case either because Mark Zuckerberg right. has a dual class share structure. I often say if Mark Zuckerberg decided tomorrow that Facebook was going to be a grilled cheese sandwich restaurant, the shareholders could do nothing other than say, well, I hope he sells a lot of them. So <laughs> we end up in this situation where not only is there not necessarily regulation, but the power and decision making is concentrated in very few hands. Mm -hmm. And I've often said the behavior on their part is actually somewhat irrational. It's short term mm -hmm. thinking, because obviously in the long run, if you make yourself hated, if you develop a product that people decide is harmful, and the fact that your book is a bestseller suggests that people are coming around to your point of mm -hmm. view, that's bad for business. Mm -hmm. And having talked with people internally at Facebook many times over the years, essentially what it boils down to is the same thing I, I hinted at the beginning, which is at Facebook, there is a North Star metric, which is user engagement, but they do yeah. not measure whether that user engagement is positive or negative. Mm -hmm. And all it would take, because we have some of the smartest computer scientists in the world, is to say, let's attempt to define positive engagement. And let's prioritize that. And let's try to reduce negative engagement. And this will likely reduce the overall measure that we have right now of user mm -hmm. engagement, because guess what? 
it is reliably easier to make people angry or afraid yeah. than it is to yeah. inspire them or right. to excite them about something. But it will be better for us in the long term because we will not be setting ourselves up to have mobs storming the gates with torches yeah, that our right. private security forces yeah. will not be able to hold off forever. That's and right. I don't know if these arguments will settle in with either Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg, mm -hmm. but it strikes me that it's, it's astonishing to me that I'm saying, well, basically the direction that this goes depends on the decisions of two different men. That's right. Yeah. So if we're talking about the effects that social media is having on democracy globally, then I would agree. Let's, we would point to Facebook uh, and to Twitter. If we're talking about adults and politics, Facebook and Twitter, and you're right, two men, very complicated motivations. Their motives are not necessarily to make the most money. They're both complicated men who have different, you know, both yes. very ambitious. Um, I'm focused on, and I actually, I started to write my book on that. I actually got a contract to write a book called Life After Babel, Adapting to a World We May Never Again Share. And Facebook and Twitter would have been the center of that. But I decided to start the book with one chapter on my side project on teen mental health left over from the coddling the American mind. And I wrote that chapter. And once I saw all the graphs laid out, once I really laid out the story of what had happened, I realized, wait a second, I can't just like drop this and go on to democracy. Mm. I mean, this is like the biggest story I've ever seen. Like, you know, this is the loss of a generation multinationally. Right. So I decided to dive in on that. So if we talk about kids, then I think it's not those two men per se, it is it is Meta and Mark Zuckerberg primarily via face uh, by Instagram. Instagram, Instagram yeah. is the one that's especially harming girls. Um, it's um, uh, it's also TikTok very much. It's newer, so we don't have as much data yep. on it. But that's I think right. TikTok is is actually even worse than Instagram. Um, so there, it's those two are the giant companies that are sucking up so much time and using it in really really bad ways for kids. I would also include Snapchat on that list. Um, mm. it, it, it's it's. Snapchat, the, the original idea, you know, if it's just sort of texting with photos, that doesn't seem so harmful. I don't think Snapchat is hurting most kids the way that the other platforms are. But so much bad stuff happens on Snapchat. So I hear so many horror stories. And when I've asked, my, my daughter desperately wants it. She's 14. She's one of the only kids in her freshman class that don't have Snapchat. Everyone's on Snapchat. But I've asked my college students, my NYU students, should I give my daughter Snapchat? And a few of them said yes. They say it's harmless. It's fun. But the majority was actually, no, don't, because don't get her started on that. Just lots of bad stuff happens. There are all kinds of ways she's going to come in contact with strangers and strange men. And the basic architecture of sending messages that disappear, that kind of seems to be made for naked photographs and drug deals. So <laughs> um, so I would include, I would definitely include Snapchat on that list. Although there, I think, you know, I think Evan Spiegel, I, you know, what little I know of him, uh, you know, I think... He, I think he has more integrity. I don't. I don't know. I shouldn't comment, but I have a more positive view of him. But I think even still, Snapchat, I think, is doing enormous harm uh, to a lot of kids. So those yeah. are the big three. Then there's a lot of other smaller platforms that are, can also be really toxic. Oh, and then there's the video game companies. Um, let me just say, because we've been focused on social media, the story for boys is a little bit different. Um, I looked into the research on video games. I was kind of hoping like maybe it'll turn out like social media is harming the girls. And it is true. A lot of them get addicted. About 5 to 10% develop problematic use, which is compulsive use like addiction. And for video games, about 5 to 10% of the boys develop problematic use, which is compulsive use like addiction. So, but, but I couldn't show that video games could explain the rise of these multiplayer video games that are so amazing, so intense. Yeah. I couldn't show that that really explains the rise for boys. Rather, the story that developed for boys, and this is work I did with Zachary Rausch, my research partner in, um, in the book, um, is boys have been retreating from the physical world, from the real world since the 80s and 90s. They're doing less well in school. Schools are made for girls. Schools are based on girls' skills. Uh, you know, you sit in a chair, you pay attention to the teacher, no more recess, no roughhousing, no wrestling, none of that. So schools have gotten worse and worse for boys and better and better for girls since the 70s and 80s. Uh, girls are kicking boys' asses in elementary school, middle school, high school, graduate school, co I mean, everywhere, PhD, yeah. everything is going female. Boys are pulling back. Boys are withdrawing, uh, in part because the virtual world is so much fun. The video games get more amazing every year. The pornography gets better and better, higher resolution, more kinky stuff. Um, so just wait until AI generates whatever they're looking for. 
That's right. Exactly. That, that already happens. You can already customize your AI girlfriend and fall in love with her. What I'm waiting for, what I'm dreading, is when that gets put into sex dolls. When you get chat, you know, you get your your replica girlfriend put into a sex doll, or a, or a, you know, what's coming soon is probably a robot with you know motorized parts. Um, it'll be the Stepford wives. I mean, boys already have a really hard time understanding girls and women, flirting, courting, marrying. And I think it's going to get a lot worse with Gen Z because they had so much porn and so little dating. And I think it's going to get a lot worse when AI shapes the lives of Gen Alpha. Um, so, you know, uh, so my point is the boy's story is different. It's about disengaging from the real world because the technology is so, it gives them what they want, but it yeah. doesn't give them experiences that will turn them into men. Gen Z boys, on average, they're not as depressed and anxious as the girls but they're not developing, they're not turning into men that are gonna go on and do something big. In fact, um, I opened one of my Atlantic articles with a conversation, this really great conversation between Pat Collison and Sam Altman, where Pat points out, he says to Sam, Sam, you know, for the first time since the seventies, there's no major person in Silicon Valley under 30. There's always been some, you know, amazing wonderkind under 30, not anymore. And Sam says, you know, because Sam is all involved in all these efforts to right. nurture talent and find amazing talent around the world. And Sam says, yes, yeah, something's gone really wrong. Like, you know, the, under 30, like they're just not, we're not seeing the explosion of talent that we used to have. And I believe that's because Gen Z has not been able to have any, they have no spare attention. All of their attention gets sucked up by a few platforms. There's not anything left over to do anything big. They want to be influencers. They want to have followers, but that's all just within the closed world of, of social media. Nothing comes out. It's like a black hole. Nothing comes out to the rest of us. There's no productivity that's coming out. A bunch of small apps, a bunch of websites, but nothing, nothing big. What do you think about that? That thesis that Gen Z is just not, not contributing, not innovating the way that prior generations did. I think that we are in the danger zone there of being like every other generation. And of course, Sam and, and Pat are much younger than, than we are. I, I think of yeah. them they're, as, they're, millennials. as yeah, they're kids, millennials, but they're millennials, mm -hmm. they're a previous generation. Yeah. I think that every generation feels that way. Uh, I continue to meet plenty of young people. I think you do as well. You're teaching over at NYU. You're meeting yeah. plenty of folks in this generation. Oh, they're very smart. They're very nice. Yeah. And again, I, I think that it might be that this is the law of small numbers and a law of perception. Yeah, I don't okay. think that we are, I don't think that we have reached a point where we are not forming human capital. I do believe that, uh, I, I agree with your thesis, that there has been significant harm that's been done and that harm affects people in different ways. And obviously it, the impact are, the impacts aren't even, but I feel like we are still producing geniuses. We just haven't seen the flowering of that genius yet. It takes time for all be. this to come yeah. through. No, I hope you're right. But let me add some more data. First, to be clear, uh, there I am not in any way blaming Gen Z. I'm not harsh on them. Right. I'm talking about this is what was done to them. This is what they were deprived of. And whenever I talk to audiences of high school kids, college kids, I ask them if they think I got this right or wrong. They almost all say, yeah, yep, yeah, that's it. This is what happened to us. The phones really did a number on us. Yeah. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is the destruction of human capital. There's actually some other measures of it. So here mm -hmm. are two. One is when you look at test scores, academic test scores, what can, pe what can students show that they've learned? In America, we have the NAEP, the National Assessment of Education yes. Progress. And that dropped a lot during COVID and people are freaking out, like, look at all the damage from COVID restrictions. Well, guess what? You look at the graph, after four, 30 or 40 years of slow but steady progress up to 2012, it reverses in 2012. It starts going down in America around 2012. And then guess what? You get the PISA data, the one giant study of educational progress around the world, 38 countries, I think it is, something like that. Um, you see the same thing. Um, it was kind of, it doesn't go back as far, but it's sort of the level, the levels are kind of flat until 2012 after 2012, they begin to go down. So right there, I would say, yeah, we are forming less human capital. Our students are learning less. I mean, just imagine when you and I were in, in high school, if the rule changed and they said, you can bring in your television set and put it on your desk. You can bring in your walkie talkies. You can bring in your record player. You can bring in your guitar bring in everything, put it on your desk and use it during class. Like that's completely insane. But if a kid has an iPhone, that's what they do. Even if they're not allowed to, they just it just means you have to just do it. You just hold it down below the desk or in a book, you hide it. Um, so we have been destroying educational progress since 2012, thanks not just to the iPhone, 
but to all of the educational technology, the iPads, the Chromebooks, all of that. There's, uh, there's no evidence I've seen that they really help education. They were just brought in on the naive assumption because we were all techno optimists that, oh, the rich kids all have computers. We got to give the poor kids computers. Everyone has to have their own laptop, Chromebook, iPad, all that stuff. Um, so we are destroying human capital in our schools. Our schools are not turning out educated people as much as they did in 2011. Things have changed. Um, and another piece of evidence, I was just over in the UK. In the UK, they have a huge explosion of disability claims of people wanting a government pension because they can't work. The number one cause traditionally was back and joint pain. People throw out their back, they're working. They, it's a physical, not anymore, at least for younger people, it's overwhelmingly anxiety. Their young people have such high levels of anxiety that soon they'll have a quarter of their workforce unable to work. I think that was the number. I can't remember where it was. You know, it was it was a gig unbelievable number um, of young people in Britain who say they're unable to work. Now, again, there could be many reasons for that, but and you know, if anxiety levels and depression levels have doubled, that is a an unbelievably large destruction of human capital. The suffering, the lost productivity, the sadness, the lost creativity. So. You know, again, I could be wrong about this, but I'm seeing a number of markers. So even if you don't care about children, suppose some of your listeners don't give a damn about children. All they care about is economic progress and wealth and prosperity. You should be really concerned about what's happened to Gen Z and what's coming for Gen Alpha. Now let's take it in directions that could be either terrifying or hopeful, which is AI to look into the future. We've got a new technology yeah. coming, yeah. AI, which is, God help us, perhaps even more compelling, more addictive, more powerful than everything that's come before it. And the question sure. is, what have we learned from the lessons of the past? And what if I made you, John, counselor mm -hmm. to the world, what mm -hmm. would you say we need to do? So I would start by saying, let's do, in the military, they have what's called an after action report, I think it is. So after you do a mission, whether it fails or succeeds, you come together and say, okay, what did we learn? What did we, how could we not make the same mistakes? And so I think we should have an after action report on social media, perhaps even a truth and reconciliation commission, not quite, but you know, we need to look at this. So, uh, so I've been in a debate with other psychologists and if, you know, in a year from now, I think it'll be clear whether I'm right or wrong. If it turns out that, that I'm right. And Gene Twenge, who did a lot of this work uh, earlier on, um, then I think we need to look very seriously. How do we make this giant mistake? This is, I mean, this is the worst thing we've ever done to our kids. I mean, okay, maybe putting them in factories was worse, but there's a lot more kids now. We're doing a lot more damage. Yeah. Um, so we have to look at that. And the biggest mistake I think we made was not recognizing that children are different from adults. So tools that are useful for adults, like networking, like, you know, LinkedIn, I, you know, I use Twitter to find information to get the, you know, tools that are useful for adults doesn't mean they're useful for kids. Um, middle school kids have no need to network online. I mean, they, you know, they can meet, they, they have the rest of the internet. Yes, yes, you know, kids from marginalized communities. Since the 90s, they use the internet to find others. They don't need the news feed. They don't need Instagram. Um, so I think we need to recognize we've got to put protections on for children with, with, with rigorous age verification, minimum ages in the virtual world, just as we have in the real world. This was our biggest mistake. If we had simply said, you have to get through puberty before you can put this at the center of your life. You have to, your brain needs puberty in the real world. And then you can go off into the virtual world as an adult. Right. That's what happened to the millennials and their mental health is fine. Gen Z is defined by the fact that they went through puberty in the virtual world and that was devastating. So so AI is coming. Um, the way that I'm thinking about that is, is like this. Um, AI is likely to bring us an era of material prosperity and sociological chaos and possible collapse. Um, we're already, we have so little holding us together. Polarization, people are talking about the risks of civil war. There's a, a book by um, Barbara Walter. Uh, I mean, we're in real, there are real risks here. Again, no one can predict the future. I don't want to be too alarmist here, yeah. but some of the paths forward are extremely scary. Now you throw in this technology that is destabilizing and change making beyond anything we've ever seen. So we should be worried for the future because of course the people making it have no idea they don't think about sociology they don't think about social psychology they're just thinking about i don't know what they're thinking about but they're not taking into account these external costs that they're going to impose on society and on children so that's the first thing second big fear about ai for me is that all the things that are hurting kids now from social media are going to be supercharged by ai so i have an article with eric schmidt in the atlantic on four ways that ai is just going to make 
social media worse. Uh, and one was the kids being drawn into the virtual world, especially the boys, as we've already talked about, when they have the goggles and they have three-dimensional naked women, say it's basically, it's like, you know, Ulysses and the sirens saying, you know, come, come spend the afternoon with me. I'll, it's game I'll over. every fantasy. It's game over. We're not going to see the boys again. They're going to check out as soon as they get their goggles. So I think we have to recognize, you know, AI is going to give us all kinds of tools and servants. AI is going to give us all kinds of servants. You can have a tutor, you can have a sex slave, you can have, you can't have a cook necessarily, but uh, you know, you have, you know, the technology is going to let us do everything easily. Now as adults, we're busy. We want things that let us do things easily. But if you have a, if you have a 12 year old boy, how many servants would you want your boy to have? Would you want him to have his own maid to clean up his room? Uh, his own chauffeur to take him everywhere? Um, his own sex bot to pleasure him so he doesn't have to talk to girls. Um, let's see, what else could you have? You you might have a butler just, just for errands, let him do errands. Like how many servants, Chris? Uh, I'm sorry, wait, Chris, remind me, you, you have kids? How old are your my kids? kids? So my kids are probably considered millennials. They're 22 and about to turn 20. So No, those are definitely Gen Z. Gen oh, Z is Gen born Z. after, yeah, Gen there Z. Born. So when, you know, when your kids were 12 years old, how many personal servants at their disposal would you want them to have? You know, probably just one, just to make sure that the hygiene was taken care of. That's important uh, for boys. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, but that, but then your kid would never learn to brush his teeth because his his butler or his his hygienist. It's unclear, does it's it. unclear if most boys will learn that other way. So uh, it's okay, better, okay, better just All to right. avoid was, the tooth decay. Okay, I was hoping you'd say zero. I personally think the answer is zero. I don't want my kids to have personal right. servants. Having a servant distorts you, and and it prevents you from learning hard things. So anyway. You asked what you know. What do we need to do? Prepare for AI. Realize, boy, did we screw up with social media. Yeah. We threw our kids into it. They're damaged be at, at levels that are really hard to comprehend. Um, and we've got to avoid making the same mistake with AI. And we've got to get age verification now, yeah. minimum age limits now. And we can't be having kids um, just you know using these AI servants um, in the way that they're going to. Yeah. And again, the, this I have seen early promise. I mean, the fact that the AI industry is generally called for regulation as opposed to saying all regulation will will strangle mm -hmm. innovation is mm -hmm. positive. I don't know to what extent that's because there are a lot of big players involved who believe that regulation and regulatory mm -hmm. capture will help them strategically. But at least there is a little bit of promise there. I like to think that we have learned something from the past 20 years. But the question is, will the lessons we learned for the past 20 years apply to the next 20 years? Yeah, yeah. And my fear is that even if they apply, it'll take us too long to apply them. So here we are. It's 2024. It's 12 years after the key year of 2012, 12 years after the girls move on to Instagram and their mental health began to decline. In those 12 years, is the science settled? No, I'm still in a debate with about five to 10 other researchers who say, no, the evidence isn't strong enough. Um, I believe I'm going to win that debate. I believe I've put up all the information. I'm writing. I'm explaining what's wrong with with their arguments. So we'll see who wins. I'm not going to change their mind. They're not going to change mine. But we'll see who the public and the scientific community finds more persuasive. But that's taken us 12 years, and it's going to take us, uh, you know, a couple more years probably before we resolve it. Um, as for the question of whether you know Chat GPT is going to make kids stupid and they don't know how to write. Well, that might take us five or 10 years to even begin studying. And by then, chat GPT will long be ancient history and there'll be 17 other new technologies. So um, so I'm very afraid that in a way we've kind of like, you know, the pace of change has been accelerating since the 16th or 17th century. Once you get the scientific revolution, change goes faster and faster. We're on the hyperbolic part of the curve. Um, in some ways, it's as though we've broken the sound barrier. So when a plane breaks the sound barrier, all the noise it makes is behind it. It's, it's, it's silence because all the noise is behind it. And, and change is now so fast that we're basically separated from, from everything that came before. We don't hear it, it's, it, it's ancient history, um, we're too busy. So I am very concerned that we're not gonna learn the lessons, we're not gonna adapt, but let's at least give it a try and let's yeah. start on the one place we know, which is social media is harming kids at a mass scale. I'm sorry, I should say, the phone-based childhood, including yes. social media, including video social games, media. just life online, yeah. yeah, and a lack of free play. Well, John, we are running out of time. So you know how you know the drill when it comes to these interviews. You should provide people with the various coordinates where they can find you and find your work. Yes, please. I hope that all of your listeners will uh, subscribe to my Substack. There's no paywall. It's free. After Babel 
babel.com. That's where I'm putting up all my analyses and all kinds of great essays by Gen Z writers. After babel.com. And especially if you're a parent, I hope you'll go to anxiousgeneration.com, which is the central site for all of these projects. And that links to letgrow.com, which is a project I started in 2017 with Lenore Skenazy to promote free range childhoods, outdoor play, more independence. You can't just take away the phones. You also have to give kids back free play, adventure, fun, thrills, risk, all the stuff that we had when we were kids that we stopped in the 90s. So letgrow.org. Those three sites, I hope your listeners will go to, especially if they have kids under under about 14 or 15. Awesome. John, cannot thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule. As you know, I've been uh, an admirer of yours since your very early work in the field of positive psychology. Uh, and it's just amazing to me how many different areas you've been able to explore and bring insights into uh, to think differently as the patron saint of the technology industry might would, <laughs> might say he would say think different i'm like no, no i'm going to say think differently i prefer grammatical correctness uh, but john <laughs> can't thank you enough any final thoughts you want to leave folks with um yeah that you know even though you've heard strains of pessimism in, in my thinking i'm actually wildly optimistic that we're going to solve this problem the kids problem and the reason is because the parents' revolution, it began in Britain in February, it's beginning here. Parents are realizing, you know, we all see the problem. We can actually do something about it. We're not hopeless, we're not helpless. It's hard if you act alone, but if you just team up with a few other parents, if you get your school to go phone free, we can all make huge change. This year, in 2024, we can change this this year at a massive scale. Awesome. John, on behalf of the rest of the Blitzscaling Startup team, thank you so very much. Thank you, Chris. What, what a fun conversation.